Hello, good evening. Today is March 18th, 2021, and I'm recording a presentation. It's a keynote presentation that I will be giving tomorrow, March 19th at 10 o'clock Arizona time. And the keynote presentation will be given at Arizona State University. And it's their annual cybersecurity symposium. And so it will be at 10 a.m. Arizona time, and that's, that will be 12 noon Dallas time. And so I'm recording this presentation and I'm going to now share my screen. And I'm Bhavani Thuraisingham from the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm the executive director of the Cybersecurity Research and Education Institute at UT Dallas. And I'm also the founder's chair professor. And so the title of my talk, Integrating Cybersecurity and Artificial Intelligence with Applications in the Internet of Transportation and Infrastructures. And I was asked to uh, time my talk between 40 to 45 minutes so that we can have around five to 10 minutes for questions. And also my host, Professor Steve Yao and Professor Adam Dupre, they will be introducing me. And so that will take, you know, welcome introductions around five minutes. So the total allocated is one hour and I will try and uh, time this talk, uh, no more than, hopefully no more than 45 minutes and no less than 40 minutes. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk about, first part is integrating cybersecurity at AI slash data science slash big data. So I'm going to use the word artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, more or less interchangeably. And so I'll be discussing several topics, big data security and privacy, privacy aware quantified self, data science machine learning for cybersecurity applications and securing data science machine learning techniques. And finally, trustworthy machine learning and AI. It's an area that is really getting more and more important. The second part, is security and privacy for internet of transportation and infrastructures and part three will apply part one to part two and that will be the applications and then end it with directions okay so we'd like to acknowledge a number of our sponsors and my colleagues professor alvaro professors alvaro cadenas murat Cantagelo, latifa khan and our former phd student is now dr raul quinones and our project coordinator, Ms. Rhonda Walls. Okay, so part one, integrating cybersecurity and AI machine learning data science. So a bit of motivation, data mining, security and privacy. Remember, we've come a long way. Now, I got into cybersecurity back in 1985 when I was at Honeywell. And we used to call it computer security and data mining and data science it used to be data management. And then in the 90s evolved into data mining and then data science and now data science and machine learning. So I introduced the idea, I say I, because that's you know, what I can remember because before 1996, not many people talked about the privacy violations that could result due to data mining, where you dig in and extract those nuggets and patterns from lots and lots of data. And so I gave a keynote address at the IFIP 11.3 database security conference in Como, Italy. And later, a version of that address was given at the Pacific Asia Knowledge Discovery Conference in 1998 in Melbourne, Australia. And then I say I published, I call it a landmark paper. Uh, the reason I call it landmark is I was a program director at NSF. And so, and that article was published in CKDD. And 
you know, when you are a, when you are an NSF a program director and you publish something, of course, everyone pays attention. It gets many citations, and also, you know, because you are also responsible for funding, and so people pay a lot of attention to you. So then came IBM Almaden. They really made a breakthrough. Privacy preserving data mining. You have the original data. You add noise, and then you get the X prime, which is added noise to the original data. Then, of course, you modify the data mining process, and then you have the final modified result. And so, the end result should be the same because you don't want to by by perturbing and randomizing the data, you don't want the results to be wrong, right? So. Then when I joined University of Texas at Dallas in fall 2004, October 2004, my first PhD student, a lady, Dr. Lee Liu. So I had joined supervision with Dr. Murat Kantajalu. So we focused on areas like privacy preserving decision trees and delved further into the perturbation method. And so data mining security and privacy, it's, privacy especially is exacerbated with big data and data science because now you have lots and lots of data right it's not the petabyte of petabytes of data that we were struggling to cope with back in 1993 in the mid 1990s now we have zettabytes and even exabytes of data right so i also we hosted a nsf workshop on big data security and privacy and that was in september 2014 and professor stevia was also present at that workshop and we presented the results to the interagency working group in february 2015 that is the nitrd that all of the agencies in washington dc get together and set the strategies so they do have a data privacy working group. And so some good things happened as a result of those presentations. Uh, there were some programs, NSF, DARPA, and so on. They uh, initiated programs in data privacy. OK, so that was sort of a motivation. So what did we do at the workshop? So big data management, security, and privacy. So now it's possible to capture lots and lots of data. And this data can be used for a variety of applications. It could be healthcare, it could be retail, it could be finance, it could be marketing, it could be medicine, transportation. So from security point of view, you need to collect a lots of data for authentication, access control, anomaly detection, and so on, right? Inside a threat detection. So analyzing and integrating lots of data on the web, you can identify connections and relationships among individuals. Uh, in turn, it could help with homeland protection, disease outbreaks. So this collected data, even if you anonymize, like removing identifiers, you can link the records together and you can re-identify the individuals. Some of the security tasks, such as authentication and access control, that could require detailed information, uh, like multi-factor authentication, right? You need to get information about your handwriting, maybe, and also your finger scans and iris scans and voice recognition. So lots of your personal data has to be collected. And this information, if it's misused or stolen, it can lead to, lead to privacy breaches. And some of the directions include securing the data, access control models, private, privacy enhanced techniques, big data analytics for cybersecurity, and of course, machine learning, because the machine learning techniques could also be attacked. That's the biggest challenge that we have right now. Okay, so then one of the projects that we started together with, uh, uh, with uh, Elisa, Professor Elisa Bertino at Purdue University, and also some work we did with Professor Maribel Fernandez at King's College, University of London, and also with Army Research Lab, Dr. Jonathan Bakdash. And so what's the idea, right? We have all of this data being collected from our smartphones, our Fitbits and so on. Mobile users such as smartphones have become prevalent in computing platform with billions of users, right? With the recent emergence of the quantified self movement, um, that's sociologists and psychologists, they want to get lots and lots of data about you because they want to give you advice. Wouldn't it be wonderful, right, if I open the refrigerator, and because I love chocolates and vanilla ice cream. So when I open the refrigerator, of course, I don't have any chocolates and vanilla ice cream in the refrigerator, but assume, let's say I have, and I try to grab some chocolates to eat. Wouldn't it be great 
if my cell phone would alert me and say, no, you're not supposed to eat this, right? Sweets, sweets are not good in general for people. So that's very good. But imagine the amount of data that is being collected. And what happens if that data is misused and someone sends that information to my insurance company, right? So the personal habits and so on, giving guidance is great. And this data could be shared by service providers, retailers, and cloud-based services. And so there could be a lot of, while there are benefits, such data collection and sharing are often being carried out without the user's knowledge, bringing grave danger. So collected data like glucose monitoring, right? And if you, and that data could be shared with your insurance companies or with people in general, and not only myself, I will be denied coverage, but my son and grandson will also be denied coverage. And that's, that's really bad. So such privacy violations, violations could easily get out of control if the data collectors could aggregate financial and health related data with tweets, Facebook activity and purchase patterns. So to address these challenges, what do we need? we need privacy protection for these quantified self applications. Okay, so this is what we have done, right? So we have our cell phone, privacy aware policy. So we are developing this policy based privacy aware quantified self, a data management framework. So data is coming, health related fitness data, location data, social media image and various sources. And our cell phone has a framework, our mobile phone, data collection, uh, data storage and access, data analytics and data sharing, right? All of that is being collected. And some of the data encrypted in cloud and access through cloud-based services. And we call this privacy aware policy-based quantified uh, self-manager. Now, this is really the quantified self-manager, right? Privacy aware, and it's connected to the cloud. As more data collected, storage on the device will not be sufficient. So some of the data has to go into the cloud. And it also depends on the types of access control policies, right? Local applications running on the device can be given access. And when needed, the apps will be allowed to access some of the encrypted data. In some cases, you may not need to store all of the data because why do you need to store daily, daily weight of a 20 year old, right? Unless of course the person is, you know, really has a condition, but a daily weight of a 70 year old, you might want to collect. In other cases, the data may have to be deleted to preserve privacy, delete and or generate fake location data to hide the fact that person participated in a protest. We envision that data sharing and analytics will be carried out using the services in the cloud. And based on some scenarios, some data may need not to be encrypted, you know, heart rate data for medical diagnosis and so on. Uh, you can see some could be sanitized and some data will have to be encrypted. And again, the key thing that I want to stress here, policy aware. So for us, going back to the previous chart, policies are guiding the data collection, data storage, data analytics, and data sharing. And one thing I wanted to add was that we computer scientists, right, we are not really, you know, very knowledgeable about the types of policies. And so we are working with the, uh, with the dean of our school of uh, political uh, policy, political and economics and political sciences. And so she works with us. And so that really helps our work a lot with respect to policies. Okay, so that's, you know, part one, which is big data security, sorry, in part one, two topics, big data security and privacy. And the other one is privacy aware policy based uh, data management framework, the quantified self application. The third topic I mentioned is how do you apply data mining machine learning for cybersecurity, right? This work is nothing new. It has been carried out for about 25 years now, and we have done a lot of work in this area since for, for the last probably 17, 18 years. And so initially we started with applying just data mining techniques for machine learning, and then we learned more and more because we are now talking about lots and lots of, lots of data. So it's not simple types of data, it's massive amounts of data, and it's data streams. So data is emanating, network data, sensor data, right? It's not nowhere, it's stopping. It's not like you collect all the intrusion data and then apply the machine learning techniques. This data is continuously arriving and you've got to develop appropriate machine learning techniques to, uh, to figure out are there any anomalies, any intrusions, any insider threats and so on. So typically the whole idea is very simply put, 
You use past data to build classification models. You predict the labels of future instances using the model. And of course, it helps with decision making. Continuous flow. So what is data streams? Continuous flow of data, very common in our connected digital world, massive amounts of data, right? So the main thing is, can you, can you develop one model? Typically, like in the 1990s and early 2000s, we developed one model and that model was used for various types of data. But the concepts are going to change today by Microsoft, tomorrow by Google, day after tomorrow, by Apple, the next day by Amazon or by Facebook, right? Concepts are changing continuously. And so we cannot have just one model. So all of this data comes in, typically, right? You have to train and then test, right? Attack data and then benign goes into the server, attack your quarantine. But this one classification model is not sufficient. Of course, from time to time, you've got to update the model. And what we do, and we have applied this to inside a threat, we build an ensemble of models, right? Collection of models. And of course, you can't have infinite number of models. At some point, some of your models are going to get outdated. So we throw away the models, right? The outdated models, and then we replace it with some of the more, you know, newer models that are more relevant. And so this process continues. Of course, a human you know, is going to could be could be in the in the loop checking from time to time, but the models themselves and our algorithms are talking to each other and deciding they vote and throw away the model that's not current, okay, or up to date. So that's our approach, and we apply it to a variety of applications, and in particular inside the threat detection. Uh, again, bad people, just like an organization, pretend to be good people. So bad processes pretend to be good processes. Insider threat detection requires the identification of rare anomalies in context where evolving behaviors tend to mask such anomalies. We have designed and developed an ensemble-based streamlining algorithm based on supervised learning that addresses this challenge by maintaining an evolving collection of multiple models. So we looked at uh, supervised learning, support vector machines, traditional and one class. And we also looked at um, uh, unsupervised learning, which we call graph-based anomaly detection. And so, as I said, uh, so we have compressed data, uh, data dictionary. So lots and lots of words are being collected, what typically what people are going to type. Remember, these are not labeled data. And so we compress them. And then from there, we try to extract patterns, right? In super unsupervised learning, compression-based techniques are used to model the common behavior sequences. This results in a classifier exhibiting substantial increase in classification accuracy for data streams. And this ensemble of classifiers allows the unsupervised approach to outperform the static approach, right? So static has some advantages in the sense, right? Training time and so on, it's labeled data, so you can train, whereas unsupervised, it takes, it's more challenging, but you know, it's, it performs much better and so eventually there could be better accuracy and so on. So this is sort of our architecture. So you have you know, a person typing all kinds of calls and so on. And so we look at chunks, we take the I chunks and then we gather data. And again, the challenge for machine learning. So I was in a meeting uh, March 17th and 18th yesterday and today. And the challenge is extracting the features. You know, so machine learning people by themselves will not be able to extract these features. They've got to work with cybersecurity specialists. Just like for healthcare, machine learning folks cannot apply healthcare applications for, uh, I mean, to extract features. They know the machine learning, but they've got to work with healthcare professional medical doctors to figure out what are the features that they have to extract, say for image recognition, cancer diagnosis, and so on. Right. So extracting these features and developing an ensemble of models, we learn uh, support vector machines or unsupervised algorithms, ensemble based. And then, of course, the I plus one chunk comes in and extracting features. So we train and then we test. Training and testing is very, you know, it's what happened probably 30, 40 years ago. But again, the two major contributions. Uh, looking at supervised and unsupervised, but more importantly, an ensemble of models. And some models are thrown away when they are outdated because streaming data and also the extraction of features, right? That is the challenge here. Okay, so that finishes 
data science for our machine learning for cybersecurity. Now, the biggest problem, right? What happens if the machine learning techniques are attacked? That will be really terrible, and that is happening. So adversarial machine learning, that's really a huge area, right? Adversary modifies data to defeat the learning algorithms. So we've got to understand the adversary. It's not about concept drifts. It's not online learning. Adversary adapts to avoid being detected during training time, data poisoning during test time, modifying features when data mining is deployed. So essentially, it becomes game playing between the data miner and the adversary. The most, so one of the popular games that's being played is the Stackelberg game, but a number of other games are also being played. Now, just look what happens, right? There is this uh, support vector machine boundary. You have the red squares, which are the bad instances, and the blue circles are good instances. And look what the bad guys are trying to do. They're going they are going to try and push as many bad instances as possible so they pretend to be good instances, right? And so how do they do that? They learn our algorithms, our data. And so what do we, what do, we do? We've got to learn what they are doing. So we've got to be a million times smarter than them, right? It's easy to say, but it's very hard. Because remember, they have all the tools and techniques. They are not just, you know, they are smart people. Okay, so... Before we talk about attacks, we've got to decide what are the attacks. So this is published in the ACM Knowledge Discovery and Databases KDD uh, conference publication. We published a paper some years ago, and I believe this was one of the early papers. So we looked at two types of attacks. One is free range attack. Adversary can move malicious data anywhere in the domain, right? So it can go anywhere in this particular domain, they can move. And I don't want to, you know, I've only got 40 minutes, so I don't want to go on, you know, sort of uh, explain this math, but the paper explains everything in detail. So, so this shows a free range attack. Targeted attack, attack, adversary can move malicious data closer to the target point, right? So, so we talk about in the next chart, I will talk about the free range attack, assuming the free range attack has happened. Our threat model, test time deployment, attacker could modify X to X prime, modify packet length by adding dummy bytes, add good word to a spam email, add noise. So he's doing, he or she is doing everything to thwart us, but we've got to be vigilant, right? So if you look at this picture, this is a support vector machine boundary, the dash line, standard support vector machine. Now, the red squares are bad instances, the green circles are good instances. So what is the support vector machine? No, what, is, what, do, what are we trying to do, right? So we are trying to modify our support vector machine, the boundary line, and instead of the dash, it's going up here to show as a blue line, right? So why we push it, right? You can see that some of the, uh, some of the bad instances that which we may not have caught with this dash line, we are catching it, right? And so we are illustrating it better here, the red and even the black here, they're all bad, bad stuff. And the green circles are good. So we are trying to push it. But you could ask the question, we can push this blue line right up here, then we could catch all the bad guys. However, there is a big problem when we move this blue line right up here, then some of the good instances will show up as bad. So we don't want false positives and we do not want false negatives. Okay, so that finishes, you know, attacks to machine learning. So one thing, one solution to this attacks to machine learning is applying game theory and looking at playing games and we try to combat uh, the adversary, be one step ahead and so on. Another approach that people are focusing on, especially those working in formal methods uh, is to apply formal methods. So before I come to that, what we want to do also, we are in some of our work, we want to execute these highly uh, critical machine learning algorithms so that they are not attacked in secure, you know, in secure hardware. So computations over big data may require massive computational resources. So again, big computational meaning machine learning on big data, right? So sometimes we could use third party services. And when we use third party services, right, 
our data, our algorithms could be corrupted, our data could be corrupted, and you can have man in the middle during data transmission inside a threat from adversaries and so on. So uh, one part of our research, we are conducting research in secure encrypted data stream processing and trustworthy analytics using advancements in embedded hardware technology I'll show in the next chart. And another area we are just beginning to look at, and I got this idea actually from a professor, a lady, really brilliant lady from Oxford University. I was serving on a panel with her in India. It's a virtual panel, of course. And she was talking some very interesting things. So she, her PhD was in formal methods. And she was discussing some very interesting things about applying formal methods, right, for machine learning algorithms. And so we've been looking at some papers and so formal methods for machine learning, including various logics for specification. So we've got to specify the various properties for deep learning and also verification algorithms, verification of the machine learning algorithm. So this area I think is showing a lot of promise and we can bring not just, you know, in the previous areas, we talked about game theory and machine learning folks and cybersecurity researchers. And here we bring some of the hardware researchers and now we can bring some of the logic and formal methods researchers because it really doesn't, you know, you can't just do it. And of course, policy researchers, it's not just one person or one field. It is a truly interdisciplinary area and we need to attack it or handle it from multiple directions. Okay, so this is the last chart for part one because I need, I've got about what? Uh, I've got about 20, 20 to 25 minutes. So uh, this is sort of the, the longest part, part one, and the rest I can, you know, part two will take probably 10, 15 minutes and part three, hopefully I can finish in about, you know, five to 10 minutes. So trustworthy analytics, the SGX enabled data analytics platform. By the way, I'm going to give this presentation live tomorrow. Okay. So the reason I uh, I do the backup presentation and send the Zoom link uh, because just in case there's a technology glitch, right? Because with technology, while it's it's really great, we couldn't have managed with technology during the pandemic, but sometimes technology can go wrong. Okay, so we have the SGX, right? Uh, for those of you all very quickly, the runtime library, the wrappers and the encrypted code. And so our data analytics or machine learning algorithms are going to be executed in secure locations, SGX enclave memories. And I'm not going to elaborate further, but this itself is really, you know, enough for a PhD topic. So essentially what I've talked about today, the privacy aware policy base, that could be a PhD topic, the data science for cybersecurity, uh, that's another one uh, for inside the threat. And that the third topic could be um, secure machine learning, uh, especially game theory based. And now machine learning, a formal verification could be another PhD topic, right? And so there are four topics already. Okay, so now I'm going to part two, which is sort of completely, I wouldn't say completely different, but uh, sort of secure uh, internet of transportation, right? And then see, and so this doesn't talk about machine learning at all, just pure cybersecurity. And it's really the work of Professor Alvaro Cardenas and I co-advised one of the students. Part of the reason I co-advised was because I also wanted to learn this area. And I find this really fascinating. And we all know what internet of things, right? Our telephones are connected to our smartphones are connected to our refrigerators, to our coffee machines and our, uh, let's say televisions and our clocks and everything connected, right? Imagine the amount of data. This is just in one house. And similarly, Internet of Things can be applied for healthcare, Internet of Medical Things, Internet of Financial Things, Internet of Transportation Things. So the cars are connected, cars connected to trains, connected to trucks, connected to roadworks. This is really a huge benefit, right? Because we want to minimize accidents. Most of us who are driving, we know the stress, especially in traffic, right? So uh, imagine, you know, cities like, uh, I believe, like Tempe, right? Where Arizona and Dallas, maybe not as bad, but imagine Los Angeles and New York City, right? It's just horrendous, the traffic. So wouldn't it be great if we can have this Internet of Transportation helping us? Yes. Internet of Transportation, uh, industry autonomous vehicles uh, aims at improving day-to-day -day activities. In U.S. alone, uh, trucks carry 63.3% of the freight of goods. AVs are not just ground, but they are also land and sea and so on, drones and airplanes and submarines and ships. 
and the level of automation ranges from zero to five. Ground vehicles is not that great. Level of automation two and aerial vehicles level of automation is four and companies are investing heavily. GM is 728 during 2008. And although plants, they were over a billion, which I read somewhere, it was indeed over a billion in 2019. And now we need to get the 2020 numbers. Why there's great potential in navies, uh, but imagine there is a huge problem, right, with respect to security and privacy. So first, let me talk about security. So security for autonomous vehicles, AVs evaluate their environment using a variety of sensors, camera, GPS, inertial measurements, units, radar, radar, and so on. Previous research has shown sensors are susceptible to malicious tampering, IMUs are susceptible to sound waves, and GPS receptors are susceptible to spoofing signals. Vehicles should verify the veracity of sensor signals before acting, acting upon them. So for instance, sensor-based, right? AVs rely on sensors to evaluate, evaluate and interact with the environment, right? Ordinary networks and operating systems don't. And inherited issues, sensors are susceptible to special types of attacks, GPS spoofing and transduction, manipulate environment, physical signals, visual sound, magnetic, and so on. Classical computing security, such as memory protection, cryptography, and authentication, they don't protect, right? Need a you need some special type of defenses. And so it's very hard to verify, right? Due to real-time constraints, AVs trust and act upon sensor data without any form of verification. We need to be able to handle that situation. So these are some of the challenges. So we develop something what we call a physics-based anomaly detector. I will explain the concepts. It seems to be really, it, you will think it's very straightforward, but I'll explain to you why it's not. So we built a reference monitor. That's the security critical component that enforces all secu security. And we want to make it as small as possible. It's a physics space, the physical properties. The algorithm consists of three parts. One, we build a model offline of the AV's physical invariance. Then we implement an online tool to monitor expected and observed behavior, right? And that's the online verification. So offline pre-processing, online verification. And then we raise an alarm if significant residual difference exists between executions. So this was presented at USNEC Security in 2020. OK, so again, what's the challenge? The challenge is coming up with this model. And this is something Professor Cardenas and the students. So Professor Cardenas is a superb control, uh, control systems uh, person as well as a computer scientist and a cybersecurity person. So he and the student built the model. I gave sort of more on the whole process was what my contribution was. So you have the state input sensor measurements and uh, you have the moments of inertia. So uh, offline pre-processing, the AVs invariants are calculated using a well-known nonlinear model for aerial and ground vehicles. So you have the accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. Sensor data on the X, Y, and Z axis uh, is used for the aerial vehicle. Vehicle position, so for the ground vehicles, we use vehicle position and steering angle, OK? So the online stage, you know, it's nothing fa fancy so far. We use an extended Kalman filter. And Kalman filters have been used for years by control engineers and electrical engineers and sensor system folks. Right, so they predict the AV's physical behavior. So we built this model, right? And looked at all the computations and the differential equations and so on. And so we estimate the unknown parameters from noisy sensor input. And the algorithm is divided into two sections, one for prediction and correct, correct the estimation before it's compared against the sensor data. That's the online. The anomaly detection, we use a CUSUM CUSUM algorithm to detect persistent attacks. And then you raise an alarm if the residual difference, right? The residual difference that you have is that you find here is larger than the predefined threshold. This is typical, you know, intrusion detection type of work, anomaly detection. So what is the challenge? That's the thing, you know, the machine learning algorithms or Kalman filter algorithms, whatever you, we use, we can use some new techniques or existing techniques. But the challenge again is coming up with an appropriate model of the system and trying to understand the data. That is really the main challenge. And so when we look at the implementation, we, imp we didn't do the sea. We are not in the ocean in Dallas, although we have lakes. Physical implementation for AVs, we had Intel ready to fly drone controller PX4 focused on detecting, remember, for aerial vehicles, GPS spoofing and gyroscope attacks. GPS attacks are detected in 0.2 seconds. 
while gyroscope attacks are detected after 1.5 seconds and the overhead is 5.433. The ground AV we custom built on top of a Traxxas Ford Fiesta um, ST Rally Chassis controller is ROS Kinetic Cam focused on detecting visual attacks. That's for the, for the cars. Attacks detected after 0 0.1 seconds and the overhead introduced was 2.25. Each threshold produces a probability of false alarms of appro approximately 2%. Okay, so this was really a very interesting uh, experience, especially for me, because I'm sort of new to this particular area, not IoT, but especially Internet of Transportation. And so right now what we are doing before I come to this, so we are sort of expanding this and building, we are planning, we just wrote a proposal to the state uh, to build sort of a smart city to contribute to Dallas's smart city and uh, smart city project. And so take some of our research and see whether we can incorporate that into the smart city uh, initiative and look at security. Now, privacy, we cannot forget. Beyond the security of individual vehicles, transportation sector could greatly benefit. I have to just check the time. Yes, I'm doing okay. Just talk for 30 minutes, I need another hopefully 10 minutes, I think I can finish it by then. Anyway, so beyond the security of individual vehicles, transportation sector could greatly benefit from a supporting infrastructure that allows communication between vehicles, motion sensors, lampposts. We absolutely need this, right? Between trucks and cars. So the more communication, it's better to reduce uh, accidents and uh, people are not stranded in the middle of the road highway. So we need in a way, machine learning techniques. And I'll talk about that in the third part. But what does it do to the user, right? It's devastating privacy con violations, right? They arise from all the information needed by systems that could lead to private information being exposed, vehicle identification, driving patterns, right? Erratic driving, or uh, sometimes if I'm smoking in my car, somebody could take photographs and send it to my insurance companies. That's not directly transportation, but anyway, the, the, my, the erratic driving especially is a very serious concern. So legislatures, engineers, scientists should keep privacy concerns in mind as advances in IoT become more and more important in day-to-day -day activities. This will aid at improving the public perception, reduce hesitation from consumers and increase the adoption rate of new technology. So we cannot forget about privacy. But we also have this critical need for security, right? So. And we have to use machine learning as well for many, many situations, right? For all these communication and so on. So what do we do? <clears throat> That's the future. So this is what we are focusing now for smart cities, applications of security AI for internet of transportation and infrastructures. <clears throat> so data science AI for transportation security, internet of transportation system subject to attacks, right? any cyber physical system. Streaming data, because this is sensor data. It's not like one lot you get the uh, anomaly data and then you check for anomalies. No, it's continuously arriving. So you need an ensemble of models. As transfer Kalman filters and so on worked, but is it working for continuous models, right? Continuous data. As transportation systems go electric, we need energy conservation. Imagine, right, if uh, there's some you know, the hackers sort of maneuver and manipulate and attack, you know, the, the, the transportation system. And also we could and reduce the amount of uh, energy and so on, because we still need some sort of hybrid cars and cars also. So the loss of lives as well as stranded. So we could lose lives. We could be stranded in lonely highways. So it could be devastating. And without a doubt, AI ML techniques are being applied to analyze the data and help us with all kinds of uh, uh, you know, activities. Can stream analytics, what I mentioned earlier, can, and we have focused on say telecom and financial data, can they be applied to transportation data? One of the main questions to understand is the complex transportation data and adapt the stream analytics techniques to apply them to massive amounts of heterogeneous sensor data. So as I said, I was in this meetings yesterday and today, and one of the things that we discussed was this, the nature, the complexity of the data. We've got to understand what types of data are we dealing with. <clears throat> so that's data science for <clears throat> transportation security. What about adversarial machine learning? <clears throat> so we have the Internet of Transportation Systems, right? Without a doubt, they are going to uh, depend heavily <clears throat> 
on data science, AI, ML techniques <clears throat> for various <clears throat> applications, optimum directions, driving without a human in the loop, and so on. Again, the adversary is watching. They are trying to learn the machine learning techniques that the transportation systems are using to communicate. What sort of data are they using? So they are watching the day, watching, trying to learn about the data, learn the techniques, and the adversary will try to thwart the vehicle's learning process. Therefore, the learning algorithm has to adapt adapt to thwart the adversary, just like I showed earlier, right? Move the line, the dash line to the blue line. Eventually, it becomes a game play, right? Between the adversary and the vehicle's machine learning algorithm. What's the challenge? What sort of game will be played? Is it zero sum game? Is it Bayesian game? We need to understand the data that is essential. And research is only beginning on this topic for transportation systems. Okay. Then I talked about privacy aware policy based data management framework, right? And so I showed a cell phone and said, or smartphone and or iPhone, whatever, uh, social media data, healthcare data, all of the data being collected according to policies and some data encrypted in the storage in the cloud, which we access through cloud based services. So, can we do something similar? Instead of smartphone, now we have a car right all the gadgets in the car they're collecting data instead of healthcare and social media we collect radar gps cameras leader ultrasonic uh, sensors all of the data is being collected and the key thing is we need policies to collect data store data data analytics and data sharing right so that is the challenge and we need realistic policies so one of the things I keep saying, I mean, I've been working, as I said, in cybersecurity since 1985, and policies have been central to much of my work. Um, but the but we come up with techniques, right? So, but so enforcement techniques, but our policies, we computer scientists, we come up with toy, T O Y policies, right? I share data with you, like Tom is telling Jane, right? Or Jack is telling, or Tom is telling Jane, I share data with you, provided you don't share it with Tom right? Oh, sorry, provided you don't share it with Jack or Mary. But that's in, in, in the real world, in children's world, that happens, right? But not in the, you know, in real policy world. So we really have to work with policy experts to decide. And even when the data is deleted, do we know the data is actually deleted? What are the policies for that? Okay, now my last chart. And <clears throat> I think the time-wise, I'm at exactly 40 minutes now since I started, so time-wise we are doing good. Developments in integrating cybersecurity AI, lots of developments exploding, right? Applications for AI for inside a threat and security for AI, adversarial machine learning. We also have privacy-aware healthcare and managing one's life activities, privacy-aware quantified self. So while all of this AI and cybersecurity is exploding, at the same time with the development of the Internet of Things and Internet of Transportation, security and privacy solutions are being developed. They are mainly physics based solutions. Okay, so, uh, and that's what I explained. As driverless cars become a reality, more and more of the autonomous vehicles will we use AI ML techniques. How can we develop the AI solutions for detecting malware in AV systems and how can adversarial machine learning work with AV systems? So these are the questions I asked earlier, right? Uh, in the previous charts. How can we develop a privacy aware policy based data management framework for Internet of Transportation and Infrastructures? That's where I showed the car collecting all the data and policies have to guide. And of course, is it possible to perform trustworthy machine learning efficiently or analytics? when so much of data is coming from all directions. So here we are talking about what? We are talking about, uh, uh, when we say trustworthy analytics, we are talking about maybe doing some of the stuff in hardware. Uh, although Intel SGX, there are some issues, but still, you know, it, it gave us some good results. Uh, but more important is new area. What about formal methods, right? Numerous opportunities for substantial research. As I mentioned, this alone, you know, we have got you know, probably eight, nine research topics just here for PhD students. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Rhonda Walls, uh, our project coordinator, and all my colleagues, uh, Alvaro Cardenas, he's now at UC Santa Cruz, 
um, Dr. Murat Kantajalu, Ladiva Khan, and Raul Quinones. So I'm going to now stop sharing. And some other things I wanted to mention, uh, I also do a lot of work for women in cybersecurity and women in data science. So we hold you know, annual uh, meetings. Actually, we, we, we chaired the WCS Women in Cybersecurity back in 2016. And uh, you know, one of my colleagues, you know, she is now uh, General Strach. She's now the head, I think, of the board, the Women in Cybersecurity Board. She's now a senior lecturer at uh, University of, sorry, Rice University. And we also participate in Stanford University's Women in Data Science every year. And uh, so these are very important uh, aspects. And so I'm also very involved in recruiting uh, minority students uh, from African American, Hispanic American, or Latino American, as well as LGBTQ communities. So I have graduated 19 students. I still have, I think, four. Right, I have, I think, one, two, three, yeah, four more in the pipeline. And out of these 19, I believe around 10, I believe, are women. And I also have African graduated African American, Latino American, and LGBTQ students. And out of the four students I have, we have, you know, two, one, two, actually three women and one man. So, uh, and, you know, I welcome male students as well. I welcome every, every, every person. Uh, but we really are trying to <clears throat> increase <clears throat> diversity. <clears throat> and I do, <clears throat> sorry, I give a lot of talks on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, you know, especially in cybersecurity and data science and machine learning, these are very important high paying jobs. And I believe that everyone should uh, have opportunity uh, to talk about, you know, to, to take part in this and benefit from this opportunity. So I'm, I'm really honored to give this presentation, especially I love talking to students. And about 10 days ago, I gave a talk, uh, Women in Communications Engineering uh, to in India, uh, Women in Communications Engineering WISE is a, a, a communications engineering society's uh, society, sub-society. And so we sent it together. There were about 200 women, I think, in India. They, I gave a virtual presentation. Together, we celebrated International Women's Day. So with that, I will end my presentation. If you have any questions, you know, we can, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions, or you can also email me, okay? Again, thank you very much, and wish you all the best and a very successful conference today. Thank you. Bye.